Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is one of the greatest singer songwriters and performers of our time. She started out in 1971 as one of the staggering Harlettes, the backup group to Bette Midler. But soon after launching her tremendously successful solo career, she had her first top 10 hit, Midnight Blue. A quick succession of hit songs followed, including Come In From The Rain, Whenever I Call You Friend, Don't Cry Out Loud, which earned her a Grammy nomination for Best Pop Female Performance, and Through the Eyes of Love and I'll Never Say Goodbye, which both got Academy Award nominations in the same year. And you should hear how she talks about you, which won a Grammy for Best Pop Female Performance, and her wonderful version of Dionne Warwick's classic Walk On By. And I can't resist mentioning my personal favorites, Fire in the Morning, It's All in the Sky Above, Help is on the Way, and Feeling for You from her fabulous jazz album, You Gotta Love the Life. Her rich, powerful voice is unparalleled. Her career is remarkable, not only for its longevity and accomplishments, but for its versatility. She's literally done it all. She appeared with Bette Midler in the movie For the Boys. She co-wrote and starred in the musical, I Sent a Letter to My Love. She's composed songs for movies. She starred in the national tours of Andrew Lloyd Webber's Music of the Night and Song and Dance, which I had the pleasure of seeing in Toronto. She created the role of Maddie on the hit TV series, Blossom. Last November, she was inducted into the Great American Songbook Foundation Hall of Fame. And now she's released her 22nd album, a brand new double CD live concert from 1977 that has never been publicly available until now. I'm beyond thrilled to welcome the incomparable Melissa Manchester to our show. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Lovely. Melissa, as you know, the terms icon and legend are tossed around pretty loosely these days, but you, Miss Melissa Manchester, absolutely epitomize those terms, and it's a huge honor to have you on our show. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. You have an amazing musical background. First of all, your father was a bassoonist for the New York Metropolitan Opera for 30 years. Yes. You attended the Manhattan School of Music and the High School of Performing Arts. You were a staff writer at the age of 17 for Chapel Music, and you studied songwriting at New York University when you were 19. Is it true that Paul Simon was one of your classmates? No, no, he wasn't one of my classmates. He was the he was the teacher. He felt like uh, I guess he was off the road for a few months and he felt like teaching. And so he auditioned everybody that wanted to be in that songwriting and record production class. And nobody could believe that it was that Paul Simon of Simon and Garfunkel. I mean, it was just wild because at the time, Bridge Over Troubled Waters was number one all over the world. But he was he was an amazing teacher. And much of what I teach these days, I pass along from his lore and his brilliance. Well, when I look at your songwriting, I think one of the reasons why so many of your songs became instant classics is because they provide a kind of emotional education for the listener, very much like Joni Mitchell and Carol King. I'm talking about songs like Be Somebody, Home to Myself, Just You and I, I Know Who I Am, and especially the songs you wrote with Carol Bayer Sager, where does that introspection and that empathy in your music come from? Well, thank you for that. I, I believe that we were writing songs that we needed to hear. Context being everything. When Carol Sager and I were writing, we were very young women in new marriages. The woman's movement was just burgeoning around us. And we were you know, we were both young working women and we were trying to find a voice and our vehicle for, for that was the song because we could not figure out how to con- communicate directly with, you know, husbands or managers or agents or lawyers or record company presidents or publishers or, or press. And so it was the vehicle of the song gave us this neutral platform to work out ideas, to work out approaches, to, to convey ideas with, with clarity without being uh, pulled off our center, as often we were. Did you realize at the time that you were educating men too? 
I did not. I, I mean, I, I did not know that I was educating anybody. We were, we were facing, as my friend would say, the great white. We were facing a blank piece of paper. Uh, we were trying to write a good song. However, the songs these songs came out of deep conversation. And once we started, once I started to hear how Carol thinks, once we started to engage in the conversation, I would start to hear the music. And I did not realize that my songs had any purpose other than to sing along to was, I think it was 1973, the, the first PBS TV special from Ms. Magazine called Woman Alive was aired. Gloria Steinem was the host and they had a segment which was really unusual. There was this woman named Krista Lee Sutton and she was the prototype for the character Norma Ray that the film Norma Ray was, was based on. And there's a scene in Norma Ray that was taken from real life. And on this PBS special, that actual scene of Krista Lee Sutton being released from jail after being arrested for trying to organize a, a union in her factory. She woke up her three kids, each one had a different father. She said, you will be called jailbird, you will be called this, you will hear bad things about mom. And she explained why she was doing this to her little children, they were little. And underscoring that actual scene was our song home to myself and suddenly I felt there's a larger purpose to these songs that Carol and I have written and it was very touching and very unexpected and uh, very moving actually. Well I want you to know that as a young gay man in the 70s mm -hmm. your song Be Somebody really resonated with me and a whole lot of other men wow. in my situation who felt very marginalized yes. and I'm just so glad I get to thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm, you know, it, as the, the long shadow of my career gets longer, I, I more deeply appreciate the service that my songs have, have been to, to people who, who found clarity through the songs, because I know that I have found clarity through songs and I know the power of a song, you know, People may diminish what can happen in three minutes and 50 seconds or whatever, but I also know that it's a world that didn't exist before you created it. And so that it meant so much to you means a lot to me. So thank you for that. Oh, it's my pleasure. When we had Paul Williams on the show a few months ago, and I know you wrote at least one song with him called yes. Crazy Loving You. Yes. He said that he can't always explain how he comes up with a song, that sometimes a melody just comes to him as if he were in a dream. Does yes. that happen to you as well? It's always that. It's, it always feels like that because the being used as the vehicle for, for lyrical ideas, for melodic ideas, it just comes from the back to the front. And sometimes you're triggered by eavesdropping in a coffee shop from the booth behind you where people are holding a conversation. Sometimes it's in the middle of the night. Sometimes it's a phrase that you read that sings to you. It's always mysterious. It's, it's always mysterious. He's quite right. When I wrote with him, you know, each, each collaborator has a different musical complexion. And when I would write with Paul, we would sit down and chat a little bit. I would tell him what I was up to. He would tell me what he was up to. Out of, out of that, again, would come a melodic idea. And he would start fashioning a lyric. I would start sort of tag teaming with him. And when we got a first verse and a chorus, he'd say, okay, I gotta go. I gotta go. I'll finish it. I'll bring it to you. I gotta go. He simply could not sit still. And off he would go. And, you know, a couple of weeks later, there was the beautiful finished lyric. But for some of my collaborators, we, we wrote it in the room, the melody at the same time as the lyric. Sometimes when I was writing with Bernie Taupin, we chatted a little bit. And then he would just send me a finished lyric, which was such literature. It didn't really need a melody. It really just could use a frame to hang it on a wall. It was so beautiful to read. But uh, yes, I've, I've been blessed by some remarkable collaborators. 
You sure have. And you have this amazing ability, even though everyone knows you're a hugely successful star. When you perform, and I've seen you live numerous times, and even when I listen to the records, you make people who feel like they're on the outside looking in, you feel like you're one of us. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Well, that's lovely. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing your words, and that is, that's very touching. It's Again, just a quality in the voice. Oh, thank you. Yes. Well, you know, what I have learned is, is that these, these songs have become living monologues for me. I never get bored singing them. I always sing them as if it's for the first time because I have learned, and it is what I teach, the art of conversational singing is what I call my course. And so that I understand that, that my, this, this monologue that I'm singing is only one side of a conversation. It had to be sung. You know, in theater, they say, in musical theater, they say when you can no longer, when you're, you know, when your feelings are, I'm paraphrasing, when your feelings are too big, you must sing. That's what these songs are for me. They all are theater pieces for me. They've become that way anyway. And so my job is to create a, a safe space for the audience to lean in and listen intentionally because I am singing to them. Well, it sure comes through. Now, you've had so many amazing moments in your career. I'll never forget a TV commercial you did in 1977 for Memorex with yes. Ella Fitzgerald. That yes. must have been an amazing experience. It was astounding. I, 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 I couldn't believe I was doing this. I mean, in those days, you know, things were coming at me fast and furiously and for the first time. And I, you know, I had no mentor. I just said yes. And Ella was, I mean, it was astounding because Ella and Judy Garland were my two musical godmothers. Uh, I never met either of them, but the tone of their voices was my guiding force from the age of five. I just wanted to be near it because even though I did not know what the word clarity meant, there was some clarity for my little five-year-old heart hearing those voices. And so I just followed them. So by the time I was invited to do this Memorex commercial with the great Ella, it was just, it was just, it was so, it was so thrilling. It was so staggering. I mean, she was, she was just a giant, you know, she was just one of the great, the greatest of all times. Yeah. I think it was one of the greatest television commercials <laughs> ever seen. It was surreal. It was just surreal. What you saw was real. It was really amazing. And she really did break that glass. It was amazing. It's amazing to me that your musical godmothers were Judy Garland and Ella. I would put Doris Day in that category too, because she had that clarity that you have. She did. She did. Well, the thing is that the singers of those eras from, oh, let's say the 40s through the 60s, they not only had distinctive voices, but they had great songwriters write stunning songs just for them. The songs, however, were so stunning that many artists recorded them, which doesn't happen that often these days. But that was just the truth of the way it worked. These, these artists, these great singers were not singer songwriters. They were singers. And it was true for the males as well. So it was just, a, it, was, it was an abundance of riches in that, that truly golden age of singer-songwriter. I mean, it started, of course, probably in the 20s, but, but in the 40s, the big band singer in the 30s when, when Ella was singing with Chick Webb and then she stepped out and became a, a solo performer. It's just gorgeous. I understand that Bob Dylan wanted you to go on tour with him back in the 70s and your manager refused the offer without even consulting you. Is that true? You know, I, I had heard that story. I was never even aware of that. I know that Dylan came to see me in Minneapolis at the Guthrie and he came backstage and he really liked this one particular song, Just You and I. And Who doesn't? <laughs> Thanks. And he invited me over to his home and I played it. And then he was, it was really unusual to be around. I did not know about the offer to perform. I mean, that's, I didn't even know how to, 
to reframe some stuff that happened in my past because it was just sort of <laughs> how could you say no to that but uh, you know honestly uh, I try to as they say look back without staring and but anyway he was he was a very interesting man and it was it was lovely to meet him Now, as I mentioned in my introduction, you've released 22 albums, and that's not counting all the compilation albums. And before we talk about the new live album, which I can't stop playing, I just have to ask you about one of my all-time favorites, the Tribute album, which is an homage to the women who inspired you, like Judy Garland, Ella Fitzgerald, Edith Piaf, Rosemary Clooney, so many others. How did you go about choosing the songs for that album? Well... First of all, Tribute was the first half of an idea that was finally completed a couple of years ago with the fellas. I had always wanted to make an album that paid tribute to the women and that paid tribute to the men. And after Tribute came out, because it was unusual being, you know, a pop singer, nobody was really interested in that project. Record companies were not terribly interested in that project. And they certainly weren't interested in me completing the idea. So it took a very long time. But the thing, the thing about choosing a song to represent these artists, all of them, the men and the women, they had such magnificent songs. They had such a magnificent body of work that it was my delightful challenge to pick out the song that only in my opinion would best represent the depth and breadth, emotional heft, and gravitas and artistry of of their stunning careers. That's what I did for the women. And of course, on Tribute, I had the great privilege of working with the great Peter Matz, who arranged the entire uh, album. And on The Fellas, my tribute to the men, I had the great uh, ability to use different colleagues of mine to arrange each song and and the idea was finally completed and it was a great joy it sure was and i highly recommend that 2017 album the fellas it's a musical tribute to melissa manchester's male musical role models like sinatra yeah. dean martin johnny mathis nat king cole tony bennett so many more but i have an idea for you for okay. you to I'm wondering if you'll ever consider doing another tribute album like Barry Manilow did, where you sing duets with the deceased artists using audio engineering. Sure. That's a good idea. (laughs) Okay. I just another thing in this brain. Thank you. (laughs) Are there any contemporary pop singers that you enjoy listening to these days? Because when I listen to Lady Gaga, she reminds me of you. (laughs) Thanks. Well, the thing about Gaga is that she, she's the real deal. She and Kelly Clarkson are the real deal. They can sing anything. And Gaga doesn't fake it when she sings with Tony Bennett. She understands those compositions. So she comes from a, a very deep, old soul, authentic place. And Kelly Clarkson is just fantastic. Oh, yeah. Now, over the years, your songs have been covered by dozens of iconic singers, including Rosemary Clooney, Dusty Springfield, Peggy Lee, Barbara Cook, Diana Ross, so many more. But it must have been a really special moment when you found out that Barbara Streisand was going to record Just One Lifetime on her album entitled A Love Like Ours. Can you take us back to that moment and tell us how you felt? I had recorded a version of Just One Lifetime. And I was told by a colleague that not only was Barbara falling in love with James Brolin and getting married to him, but she was going to dedicate an entire album to this love of hers. And I thought about this song, Just One Lifetime, and I sent it to her executive producer and he, he shared it with her and she loved the choruses, but she couldn't follow the lyrics. And he said, would you consider rewriting the song? And I thought, nobody's ever asked me to do that. But so I brought it to my collaborator, Tom Snow. And I said, would you deconstruct this with me and reconstruct it? And he agreed. And we, I was very mindful of where she was in her life. I know that spiritually she was, she was 
studying more. She was opening her heart more. This new love was really awakening something that had been asleep in her life, I guess, for decades. And so those lyrics really reflected where she was at. And it was, it was amazing when we got the phone call that she was going to not only record it, but sing it at her wedding and the great, sweet, late Marvin Hamlish would be arranging it and the equally great sweet and late Arif Mardin would be producing it. And so it was just, it was thrilling because, you know, Barbara, who's, uh, who, who came before me, she, she was fully, she was fully born, like out of the head of Zeus. She just knew her, she knew her space at a very young age. My parents actually saw her when she was 19 and opening at the Bonsoir. And she, they would come home and say, we saw this young woman. She's unbelievable to listen to, but she was dressed in the nightgown because <laughs> that's what she would do. She would go to these vintage, vintage shops. She was poor as a church mouse and she would just throw on something that was appealing to her. So for, you know, and then I saw her as Miss Marmelstein in I Can Get It For You Wholesale. And then, of course, Funny Girl. And to have that unbelievable circle to be completed with her recording a song of mine and Tom Snow's, it was just, it was, it, it, you know, my head exploded. It was just fantastic. Well, I hope you know that all of your fans were very proud of you. <laughs> That's so sweet. Now, in 2015, you released a highly acclaimed jazz album entitled You Gotta Love the Life. And you did something almost totally unheard of at the time. You yeah. used crowdfunding to get the album released. Am I right that this idea came from your students at the USC Thornton School of Music? Yes. <laughs> I was, you know, by your pupils, you'll be taught. I was teaching songwriting at USC Thornton School. And each one of them was coming in with a new project. You know, it had shiny wrap and it had lovely photographs and it had credits. And I was still working under an old paradigm. I said, wow, how did you get this done? Are you being signed to an independent label? And they said, no, we're crowdfunding. You should do that, they said. I said, gee, great, what is that? And one of my students sat with me and my manager and said, this is how you do crowdfunding. And I said, please, just whatever you're about to say, start each sentence with once upon time. Otherwise, I won't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> and they made it very simple for us to understand. And we did create it. And it was amazing. I mean, it was just amazing because your fan base suddenly became like this village of sweet aunties and uncles yeah. who were just sort of gently encouraging you to move along carry on you know at one point I said I'm so sorry this is going to be delayed by a month and this is the reason why it had to do with a printing or something like that and they said that's fine you take your time we'll be <laughs> wow there are folks out there and, and what was thrilling about You Gotta Love the Life, among many other things, is that there were unbelievable guest stars, not by my design. People just came out of the woodwork and wanted to be a part of this. My dear Al Jarreau, yeah. it was one of his last performances singing on Big Light, which I wrote with John Prue. Stevie Wonder called me while I was in Florida at two in the morning saying, this is Stevie Wonder. I hear you're making a record. I'd like to be on it. I'm thinking this better be real. <laughs> and, and Stevie showed up. He played harmonica on a song I wrote with Tom Snow. Your love is where I live. And he was magnificent and generous and beautiful. The late Joe Sample played on a song. That was really interesting because Joe Sample, it was one of his last performances. He was quite ill at the time. It was one of his last performances to a song where I set music to the last lyrics of Hal David. And Dionne Warwick, who was an old friend of mine, 
she built her career on the music of Bacharach David. And I reached out to her, I said, would you sing this final duet of Hell's? And so there we are, two women singing this beautiful haunting song. And uh, it was, it was just, I mean, it was just amazing. So, and I recorded it at the studio of Citrus College where I'm artist in residence. Uh, Citrus College is, is a beautiful community college down in Glendora, California, not far from here. And they have a stunning uh, recording studio, but their music department is so magnificent. Actually on the Fellas album, I'm using the student big band. It's called the Blue Note Orchestra and it's made up of students, alumni of the school and professors. And so these kids are taught with such love and discipline and it's, it's just unbelievable to be a part of this. And the kids get real life credit for performing with me. So I've had them on stage with me and uh, it's fantastic. It is fantastic. That is an album for the ages. You gotta <laughs> love the life and the best crowdfunding cause I've ever seen. Ah, thanks, now, man. I before we talk about the new album, I just wanna mention to you that in 2008, you released a very important song called The Power of Ribbons and the proceeds went to breast cancer research. I just want to acknowledge what a wonderful thing that was to do and to thank you for doing it. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure. Okay, so Melissa, let's talk about this new double CD live album, Melissa yeah. Manchester Live 77, which can be purchased by going to realgonemusic.com. The album is a long lost recording of a concert you did in Gainesville, Florida in 1977. The obvious question, what was wrong with Arista Records and why, did, <laughs> why were we deprived for so many years of this album? I'm really not the one who is fully able to answer that. What I have been told is that Clive and the fellas just felt that a live album was not, would not be the appropriate follow-up to Midnight Blue. And they just kept it in a vault. I mean, it was, you know, here's the thing. What I have come to learn is that there is my time and that there's God's time. And I'm much better off if I lean into God's time than my time, because all I do with my time is get cranky. But, um, but, but the fact that this has been in the vaults preserved for 45 years or however long it is, and that it shows up in this moment is so, is so touching because I'm nearing 50 years of my career. So to reflect back on where I was in 77, which really, it was really at the beginning of my career, really. And I, I mean, I can, I can, my, my body memory can remember the exhaustion and the exhilaration of those days. I had no vocal technique. I was like a, I was like a racehorse. You know, every time I stepped onto the stage, you know, I just needed to race. I just needed to, to sing and and share and leave everything on the stage and and interact with with my band and it you know I had no mentors there was no polish I was very raw the music was very raw but it was it was touching because it was touching those those college audiences well and the rawness translates to authenticity miss melissa manchester which we were craving then and now and what I love about this album is the song selection. I mean, in addition to the big hits like Midnight Blue, Better Days, Coming From the Ring, you sang really great covers of I Want to Be Where You Are, Rescue Me, Monkey See, Monkey Do, and you even sang a classic blues song, High Heel Sneakers. When you listen to that live recording now, what goes through your mind? I, I, I feel for that young woman. I really do. I really feel that she was on her journey with, with help, but, but she, the, the, really the only place that she had any kind of clarity was on stage or sitting at the piano writing. Because to try to find a, an effective way to communicate with mostly the men around her was very difficult. And so I was, 
and and to feel that and to <laughs> to hear how raw that was i mean i think it may have you know the tape that that they found in the vault was this thin i mean it was half inch it wasn't even you know this big with tracks it was very thin so it was just you are it's as if you are sitting in the theater hearing the performance you're one of the audience members and and i found that really touching and i i love that girl I do too, I'll tell you. <laughs> I was really struck by the fact that you closed the show with no one's ever seen this side of me, which is kind of eerie, don't you think? Because we didn't get to hear this concert until now. The synchronicity yes. is spiritual. Yes, amen. I agree. I mean, I just I, I just think that, that it has showed up in the right moment. I, I think it, it will touch listeners hopefully to reflect back on where they were in 77 and what they were going through in 77. I mean, that's the thing that is so touching that I hear over and over again is, is how my songs helped people identify who they were, help them get through a hard time, help them get through a jail term or Vietnam or, you know, a rough childhood or, or, or coming out or yeah, coming out or, or, uh, you know, deciding to make a baby, deciding not to commit suicide, deciding to work for a relationship. It, it's, it's really, uh, none of this was on my horizon so that that's reflected back to me over and over through these years is just an astounding gift, really. Well, when I look back at your career in 1977, specifically, when you recorded that concert, you were an international superstar, but it's well known that Clive Davis, the head of Arista Records, wanted to keep you in the pop music zone in terms of your recordings, but your musical tastes were much more towards R&B and soul music, which we could see in your concerts. Yes. In 1985, you signed with MCA. Did that change from Arista to MCA bring you more satisfaction in terms of your musical choices? It just gave me another opportunity. I mean, the, the name of my game was just just find a way to keep making music. Because remember in those days, there was no crowdfunding, there was no independent label, there was no independent artist really. And so it was just to find the next rung on the ladder to keep going. And so that was it. So, you know, again, my students much later reflected back to me that everything had changed in the music industry that you didn't need to sign with a record company because a, there were very few that still existed and B you could circumnavigate them and still have a career because of YouTube. I mean, YouTube changed it, changed everything when that showed up. So is it very liberating for you to be your own boss? Now you have total control over the material you choose to record. Yes, it's completely liberating because whatever is in my head, I can find a way to translate. And I have a, a small group of trusted colleagues, and I'm always looking for new colleagues to bounce ideas off of. And so, so yes, there's not, you know, it was so weird when I made the first two records on, uh, on Bell Records, uh, Home to Myself and Bright Eyes, you know, I was really left alone just to create. And I thought that's what that was going to be my path for the rest of my career. And then when I was absorbed into Arista, thankfully, with Barry Manilow and Tony Orlando and Don, you know, Clive Davis and those fellas, they needed singles. That's that was the vehicle. And suddenly I was after the Melissa album that had Midnight Blue and Just Too Many People. I was really starting to have to fight to find a place as a songwriter on my albums because... I was writing songs. I wasn't really thinking that much about writing singles. And they wanted so, hits. They did, and and I understand that. So it was just it just took a it just took a long while for me to to navigate the waters. And so in the end, here I am in a in a new day and making more music and making it in a in a different and unusual way. And I'm thrilled that I can keep doing this because it's it's my favorite thing. Besides my children, it's really my favorite thing. And you have another album in the works entitled Review, containing yes. previously unreleased songs, as well as updated versions of some of your classic hits. Yes. And you've been releasing individual songs over the last few months. When will we get the full album? 
Well, hopefully later this year, for sure. What I tried to, what I started to do was I started to release the singles with accompanying videos during the pandemic because we weren't going anywhere. And I was noticing that many of these songs, like Just You and I, were growing into this moment. So that was, so the video of it, all of this you can find on, on YouTube. The video of it was an homage to first responders. And when I released Midnight Blue, it was really a musical conversation between the younger me that had the hit of Midnight Blue and the older me who's re-recording it. And so, so with each single, I found something new to, to record, some harmonic tweak. None of these songs have fades, by the way, not one. Because what I learned from the stage, which I love, is that songs come to an end and the audience gets to applaud. Yes. And so I and I love listening to, you know, I, I understood the, the purpose of a fade, you know, in, in re, on records past. But I just thought I want to liberate everything from having a fade. I just want every song to end. And that's it. Onward to the next. So we're almost done. I just I'm recording the last track now. We're preparing for the last three videos now. So it's exciting. We're seeing the light. I can't wait. Yeah, I, want, I want to mention again to our viewers that you can get Melissa Manchester's brand new double CD live concert by going to realgonemusic.com. And you can follow Melissa's career and find out everything that's happening, including her tour schedule, by going to her website, melissamanchester.com. Well, Melissa, I have only one more question for you. Sure. Do you get, I mean, deep down inside, do you really get how incredibly talented and beloved you are? Well, <laughs> thank you. I, do I get it? I, I have a sense of it and it's, it, it, it's remarkable. It's really remarkable. I'm glad that you have a sense of it because there are simply no words to tell you how grateful I am to you and to your manager, Susan Holder, and your publicist, Stephanie Weiss, for making this interview happen. It really is a dream come true to be able to tell you in this very public way how much you and your music have meant to me and to your millions of fans around the world. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Our guest has been the spectacular Melissa Manchester. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.